Fort Sill, Oklahoma. These American gunners are learning how to shoot sophisticated pieces of military technology, today's big guns. Weapons that control the most powerful forces in a fraction of a second. This is the M777 howitzer, part of the US Army's arsenal. When it fires, the temperature inside the gun soars to 2,500 degrees Celsius. Its barrel must contain more than 7,000 times the energy of an AK-47 assault rifle. And its shell travels three times faster than a Boeing 747. These core elements of modern artillery and how generals have used them have evolved over centuries of trial and error. Before artillery, there was the bow and arrow. But the bow was only as powerful as the archer. There's a limit to how much the human body can pull the bowstring. And also, uh, the length of the human arm uh, makes the range and strength of discharge essentially very limited. Artillery took warfare beyond the limitations of a soldier's reach. Its evolution, to begin with, was a constant quest to increase range. This evolutionary journey begins around the year 421 BC. In southern Italy, an ancient Greek force deploys a new kind of weapon against an Italian tribe. It may have been the very first artillery piece used in warfare, the Gastrophetes. In essence, it's a mechanical bow that uses tension as the power source. Mechanizing a handheld weapon is how early artillery inventors solve the problem of how to hurl a projectile further. A normal bow allows you an effective range of about 150 to 200 meters, and the gastrophetes probably increase that to about 250 meters. That extra 50 meters is vital especially against an enemy that has no artillery. But to shoot something heavier than an arrow will require more power than the gastrophetes can provide. How this engineering problem is tackled fascinates Ivan Williams. He believes early inventors found the solution by observing nature. You can see it on big trees when the wind blows and they twist, then they twist back again. All those fibers, as they twist together, want to come back again. So it's a big spring. You can see it, this tree here that's been split, and the fibers, as I split it, have followed it round in a curve, clockwise curve. So as I move this arm round, all the fibers in that tree, top and bottom, are twisted tighter together, and that creates a lot of energy. That's quite difficult to pull round. The action of twisting the tree stores up energy. This springy sapling points the way to a weapon system that would supersede the gastrophetes. Torsion power, a system that would revolutionize artillery. Wood, fiber, even human hair can be turned into rope, and all can be used as the power source for torsion artillery. What you have to do is to crank it round, turn it round, spin it round somehow, rotate it so that you're harnessing that inherent natural force, control it, and then release it at precisely the right moment. The ancient Greeks built and tested various torsion artillery pieces in the fourth and third centuries BC. British experimental archaeologists have painstakingly reconstructed one of these machines. It's called a ballista, and its capabilities are a step up from the gastrophetes. We want to throw heavy rocks, you know, 30 pounds and more, 60 pounds. So to do that, a different power source is required. 
what twists it and stores the power is a steel arrangement up here with a pin that goes through the rope and then is locked into place with this pin here. Torsion power means that for the first time, heavy stone missiles can be shot over long distances. The Greeks invented artillery technology, but one of the most striking examples of its use in ancient warfare was provided by the Romans. It is the year 73 AD. The fortress of Masada in today's Israel. Rome's 10th legion lays siege to a force of Jewish rebels holed up in this lofty stronghold. More than 400 meters above the desert floor, Masada appears impregnable. Yet the Romans are able to build a ramp up to the walls and batter their way in. Key to the success of this assault is the way the Romans use torsion artillery. This is a ballista ball that was found here during the excavations, and they were found scattered all over the area. And in large concentrations near the breach in the fortress wall at the top of the ramp. The Roman commander, Flavius Silva, seems to have been employing a specific artillery tactic, suppressing fire. These weapons are not capable of battering down huge 12 or 13 foot thick walls. They are purely designed to keep people off the top of the walls so that they don't interfere with your siege preparations. Everything was directed to one thing, to bring the battering drum on top of the ramp to those 20 meters, 25 meter wide area where they wanted to breach the wall. As the huge siege tower with its battering ram inches slowly up the ramp, Roman artillery keeps up suppressing fire, both from ballistas mounted on the siege tower and also from positions at the bottom of the ramp. At Masada, tactical use of ballistas contributes to the defeat of the rebels. Fortress walls are no insurance against this kind of attack. Artillery helps the Romans succeed in a siege. It also plays a vital role in how they build and defend their empire. Technology reacts to pre-existing need. The Romans are going to be outnumbered everywhere they fight if they're on the frontiers in Asia or Northwest Europe, the problem that they're going to face is they're going to have tribal armies that have far more combatants. You can harness technology to equal the odds so that one bolt can go through and kill six, seven, eight, nine people and make people so scared that they'll, they'll flee. The Jewish historian Josephus witnessed the terror tactics of Roman artillery at first hand. When a pregnant woman was struck in the belly on leaving her house, the unborn child was flung a hundred meters. So tremendous was the power of that stone thrower. Artillery in the ancient world had a shock and awe value. The very visceral effects of the impact of projectile fire had a great demoralizing effect on defenders. Artillery becomes a standard part of many commanders' armory. Victory now no longer depends just on hand-to-hand -hand combat, and killing becomes a less personal matter. Weapons that strike from great distances begin to change the way battles are fought. At this gun factory in Mississippi, Engineers are building M777 howitzers. When finished, they will have produced a gun with the power to shoot a shell in excess of 24 kilometers. That's 80 times further than the torsion-powered ballista. 
Just as engineers today try to maximize the range of modern artillery, so the inventors of the past tried to increase the distance their weapons could achieve. In the 12th century, a new kind of artillery appears on the battlefield, the counterweight trebuchet, the most powerful weapon the medieval world produced, an invention that surpasses what torsion technology had been able to achieve. This is Falster Island, Denmark. Home of the medieval center. Here, men are busy recreating the technology of the past. Engineering trebuchets is one of their specialities. Believed to have originated in China around 400 BC, the early trebuchet seems to have been a simple device like this. Soldiers pulled on ropes to propel a missile from a sling. Knowledge of this technology traveled westwards. Now, when did it come to Europe? That's a real question. We really just don't know. But in the Crusades, we see the true origins of the trebuchet that we know today. The trebuchets used in the Crusades are a much more advanced machine that use a mechanical counterweight to shoot projectiles. It is this 12th century version of the trebuchet that experimental archaeologist Peter Vemming wanted to build. This one is 22 meters high and works by releasing a counterweight that can weigh the same as four SUVs. When we build a machine like this one, we lack 1,000 years of experience. That's why you call it experimental archaeology. You have to try and try and try. Yeah, so I can begin to go. And you need a lot of manpower. As the men inside the wheels walk, they winch a rope and pulley system that slowly raises the counterweight. Meanwhile, a distant floating target is pushed into place, nearly 400 meters away. The sling on the end of the firing arm shoots a stone ball that weighs 15 kilograms. Short a few feet, about 20 feet to the right. Each shot reaches or even goes beyond the target. Lack of a direct hit isn't the drawback, it appears. In the Middle Ages, the trebuchet will be either aiming shots at or over a whole castle wall and trebuchets can also shoot missiles that will shatter on impact into lethal flying fragments. Eyewitness accounts suggest they are also used as a terror weapon. We get these stories of them launching uh, things over the walls. Bells with oil that they could ignite the heads of their enemies that they captured to scare the people inside. We even have the sources that tell us that they sent back captured spies, enemies, and you knew they were landed when the cry stopped. Sometimes just the threat of trebuchet attack could be decisive. The best siege is the one that's not fought. If you have this big, huge device that launches things over the walls and into the walls, and the sound is incredible, and fires start, and people are going to say, uh, we've had it. Uh, we're surrendering now. It's done. Fortification engineers have to fight back. Their response 
is the concentric castle with its multiple defensive walls of immense width. In the bitter crusader battles of the 13th century, these castles can resist trebuchet attack. Generals need a new tool in the battle of punch and counterpunch. They find it in the form of gunpowder, one of the most important steps in the evolution of warfare. France, 1324. The city of Metz is under attack from feudal lords armed with a new weapon. A minor battle, but it's the first recorded use of gunpowder artillery. From then on, we realized that nothing's going to be the same. Gunpowder weapons of large caliber, of small caliber, big, huge guns, smaller guns will all have a great impact. And it's not long before trebuchets are gone. It's not long before archery's gone, crossbows. Everything will change. From its invention in China, knowledge of gunpowder spreads. But it is the marriage of gunpowder with a barrel that made this such an important moment in the evolution of artillery. The problem is how to effectively contain the energy of this propellant inside the gun barrel. The material the barrel is made from is fundamental. When you're developing something new, you try all sorts of things. You would have tried anything to hand. And of course, at an early stage, you might have tried bamboo. This 10th century Chinese illustration shows Buddha being attacked by a demon wielding what could be a gun barrel made from bamboo. Armorer Scott McIntyre has designed his own version of a bamboo gun barrel. Here I have a typical projectile, which is actually a papier mache ball, and behind that there's a gunpowder charge. If that is actually inside a tube, when this charge is ignited, it will build up an awful lot of pressure. McIntyre's tube will be a hollowed-out piece of bamboo. That's pretty much there now. There's just a few more small pieces, but, uh, yeah, that looks pretty good. The bamboo barrel needs to be securely strapped down before it's fired. The projectile will be loaded in down to here. There's a bung in here which will then contain all the gas as it expands. The projectile will travel down the barrel exiting the muzzle here and hopefully reach our target over there. The bamboo shoots effectively, but even with the target less than 50 metres away, it's not very accurate. It takes five shots to get one on target. So it's possible that bamboo could have worked as an early gun barrel. Today's artillery barrels deal with incredibly powerful forces. Before any modern artillery piece is delivered to a US Army unit, its barrel has to be taken to the limit. Here, in the middle of the Arizona desert, is where that happens. Yuma Proving Ground. All stations, stand by for a five second countdown. Two ground number 45 in five, four, three, two, one. Each M777 has to perform at the maximum pressure the gun barrel has been designed for. That's done by loading it at the rear breech end of the gun and shooting the heaviest high-explosive projectile with the highest charge at the hottest temperature possible. The barrel can withstand these forces because it's made from a single solid piece of hardened steel. 500 years ago, the technology of the barrel was more advanced than bamboo, but nothing like as strong as a modern gun barrel. July 1545, the Mary Rose, flagship of Henry VIII, 
sinks off the coast of England. This cannon is from the shipwreck. What's really wonderful about this piece is because it sat on the seabed for so long, what's happened is parts of the, the surface are completely corroding away, revealing the structure inside. It's made of long strips of iron, which we call staves, which you can see along the top here, and they run the whole length of the barrel. And around it, they put rings and hoops of iron. The corrosion reveals a construction similar to that of a wooden barrel. kind that would hold dry goods or beer. Both types of barrel relied on hoops to hold the staves together. The gun simply replaced the wooden staves with iron ones. But there is a potential weakness with this method. When this experimental gun fires, explosive gas leaks out through the wooden staves. This kind of flaw was common in hoop and stave iron guns and could be disastrous. Every shot had the potential to explode the barrel and kill all of those standing around the weapon. What you're really looking for is a material, a piece of artillery which is a very good solid, continuous piece of metal. And the skills to make this kind of metal were to be found in a traditional branch of craftsmanship, bell founding. At this foundry in Loughborough, England, they cast bells in the medieval way, using molten bronze in a mold. In 14th century Europe, this technology is adapted to casting gun barrels. All you've really got to do is make a different form of mold. You already have the furnace, the technology and the knowledge of bronze to do it. By the mid 15th century, big guns can be made from a single piece of bronze. Gunpowder artillery has diversified, both in size and power, in purpose, in metallurgy. Uh, People are starting to understand, generals and leaders are starting to understand how valuable guns are. 1453, Constantinople, today's Istanbul in Turkey, a city under siege from the expanding empire of the Ottoman Turks. By the beginning of the 15th century, the Ottoman Turks were actually behind in gunpowder weaponry, but by the middle of the 15th century, they're above everybody. It's as if they got this incentive to build guns uh, and build them of enormous size. Big guns that the Ottoman Sultan Mehmed II unleashes against the walls of the greatest city in the world. Guns like this. This great Turkish bombard was cast in 1464 for Mehmet II, the conqueror of Constantinople. This is the breech chamber which contained the gunpowder, loaded in here and held securely by a wooden plug that would be hammered in, it would help to build up the pressure. Then the two halves are brought together and with huge effort using wooden spikes in these recesses, the barrel is screwed onto the breech. The breech half alone of this bombard weighs eight tons. So the barrel's already been screwed together. It needs to be loaded with one of these massive stone granite cannonballs weighing over 600 pounds. Pounded for nearly two months, Entire sections of Constantinople's wall collapse under this sustained bombardment. The city falls, and military leaders around the world take note. The fall of Constantinople was a major watershed, not only in political and economic history, but in the history of military technology, in that it showed that even the most powerful, thickest walls could be brought low by gunpowder technology. Artillery once again has the upper hand over fortifications. Yet gun barrel technology hasn't eliminated defects in casting. 
gun barrels cast like bells have proved themselves stronger than hoop and stave guns, which had leaked gas. But they still sometimes explode. Before around 1470, cannons cast in bronze were cast with the breech of the gun, the back of the gun, they were cast vertically, and the breech was at the top and the muzzle was at the bottom. The problem was, when you poured it with the breech up, the impurities tended to gather at the top. So, of course, the impurities, the, the gaps, were in that part of the gun where the explosion happened. So you always had inherently weak guns. What someone realized you could do is you could turn your cannon over, and you now cast it with the muzzle up and the breech at the bottom. So the best metal, the best casting now, is at the bottom, at the back of the cannon where the gunpowder was. Guns are now a lot safer for their crews. And while bronze barrel technology leaps forward, so too does gunpowder. This is corned or grained gunpowder, a result of refining the gunpowder production process in France in the 15th century. When you have grained powder like this, the first grain to ignite generates a flame which shoots between the adjacent grains. What this means is you can get powder that burns seriously fast. The right-hand trail is typical of gunpowder of the early 1300s. The one on the left contains corned gunpowder. Watch what happens when the two trails are lit simultaneously. Firing! Four, three, two, one. In just three seconds, the corned gunpowder trail burns right through. The primitive gunpowder takes another 38 seconds to burn to the end of its trail. When you got to corn powder, you had really good high explosive, which you could then develop a better cannon for and get longer ranges and better smashing power. It isn't just gunpowder that's improving. Now there's a gradual change in what big guns shoot, as stone cannonballs are replaced by iron. When they did develop the idea of cast iron, it obviously was the ammunition to use, because size for size, cast iron is three times heavier than stone. It's not going to shatter when it hits a hard fortification, and it travels through the air more efficiently. Heavy metal soon becomes the standard for artillery projectiles. Packing all that punch is wasted, though, if it misses the target. So a great deal of this gunnery training exercise concentrates on accuracy. We're a precise organization, and we deal in uh, precision. We, as artillerymen, measure many aspects of what we do. We measure the muzzle velocity, the speed at which the round departs the tube. We measure the weather so that we take into account for that. We measure the accuracy of the target so that we know exactly where that is. This quest for precision and accuracy begins in earnest in the 16th century Italian town of Verona. Poking out of a cannon muzzle, this gunner's quadrant is the product of Renaissance science. It owes its invention to Niccolo Tartaglia, a professor of mathematics. What Tartaglia did was he took the subject of gunnery from being a bit of a black art. He brought it into the light of Renaissance science, and he tried to see why the cannonball flew the way it did. Tartaglia wrote down a theory based on a cannon shooting on a flat trajectory with zero degrees of elevation. And this more than 120 years before Isaac Newton arrives at his theory of gravity. There was no developed theory of gravity in Tartaglia's time, but what he realized was 
that the cannonball would start to fall from the muzzle of the gun as soon as it was fired. He also worked out mathematically the angle of elevation needed to achieve the maximum range. At zero degrees elevation, a shot from the cannon barrel quickly falls to earth. Raise the barrel to 22.5 degrees, and now the shot travels in an arc, improving the distance it achieves. Double that to 45 degrees, and the shot reaches its maximum range. These calculations inspire Tartaglia to invent an invaluable instrument for gunnery. The gunner's quadrant allows you to set the angle of the gun to a particular elevation to control the range, and you read it off with a plumb bob. As the barrel is elevated using hand spikes, you'll see the plumb bob move. Adjusting the wedge at the rear of the barrel results in a few degrees of elevation. Of course, the plumb bob is really staying vertical because of gravity, and the barrel is moving the scale up and down. Being able to record the angle of elevation like this helped to improve the accuracy of cannon. It takes the Industrial Revolution to push artillery into its next evolutionary phase. By the 19th century, this leads to the development of machine tools. Now the components of both muskets and cannon can be made with precision. Result? greater accuracy on the battlefield. One of the first times artillery demonstrates its deadlier power is in the American Civil War. Antietam Creek, Maryland. In September 1862, this was the scene of the bloodiest day in American military history. A day when new artillery <coughs> contributes to the killing and wounding of more than 20,000 young men. A soldier who fought at Antietam witnessed the murderous effect of artillery that day. A converging storm of iron slammed into the batteries from front and flank. Wheels were smashed, men knocked down, horses sent screaming. By the middle of the Civil War, we're seeing many, many rifled guns come into place. Now, what does rifling mean? It's a series of grooves that are cut into the barrel. And those grooves, if you were to look down the barrel, actually turn. Why? We have a new type of projectile. High-speed camera footage of a modern artillery shell shows how these new elongated projectiles behave in the air. This one's traveling at two and a half times the speed of sound. A shell that is fired from a rifled barrel spins in flight and this significantly improves accuracy. Your projectile is going to come out of this barrel, properly fitted, and it is going to continue in a perfectly straight line to its target as it spins, holding its stability the whole way. At Antietam, the Union side has a two-to-one advantage in rifled artillery. When these more accurate guns engage the Confederate smoothbore pieces in the Dunker Church area of the battlefield, they take a terrible toll. The Confederate artillerists actually refer to that battle as artillery hell. And this is where the opposition of smoothbore and rifled cannons really shows itself in, the, in its deadliest possible form. A shooting competition can show how a rifled gun can get a critical edge in accuracy over the smoothball. These targets have been positioned 150 yards from this Napoleon smoothball gun, an original American Civil War piece.
Time to see how these guns perform. Fire! The smoothbore's round shot seems to be pretty accurate at this short range. But after five shots, there have been no dead center hits. Next up, it's the turn of this 1861 Parrot rifled gun, shooting different elongated shells that spin in flight. Fire! Wow. Move! After two shots, the rifled gun is already demonstrating its superiority. Fire! Ah, right down the ball. Exactly down the center. Perfect dead center bullseye. At the Battle of Antietam, rifled artillery offers deadly accuracy at a greater range than smoothbore guns. Civil War battles would have taken place using this type of munition at 600, 700, even a thousand yards, and at that point, this circle becomes much, much larger, possibly as large as 20 feet, which means these may have missed their target entirely. Think of it this way. You have two cannons opposing one another. One is a smoothbore, one is a rifle. They're trying to knock each other's guns off their carriages and silence that artillery piece. This gun could put that gun out of commission and they could not return fire accurately enough to stop them. Technology is slowly but surely divorcing soldiers from the act of killing. The Industrial Revolution made artillery deadlier than ever. Now it will change the material the gun barrel is made from. This artillery piece is being decontaminated and cleaned up to go on display at the U.S. Army's Ordnance Museum. An extremely powerful high-pressure washer effortlessly removes the old paintwork, revealing the original metal underneath. Steel. Steel has immense tensile strength and you can also heat treat it. You can do all sorts of things to steel to make it the ideal material for building gun barrels. But up until the mid 19th century, producing a block of steel big enough for a gun barrel and with this tensile strength had defeated weapons manufacturers. Steel to start with is not a metal that can be used for gunnery. They made barrels of steel and they burst. Then, in 1847, German gunmakers Krupp cast a huge block of steel using nickel and manganese alloys. At last, a type of steel that works as an artillery barrel. Artillery has come a long way and is, in its essentials, very close to this M777 gun. Yet there is one major hurdle to overcome, how to increase the rate of fire. The answer lies in dealing with the problem of recoil. What's one? Stop. Clear? This machine is testing the gun's recoil system. One of the major problems with artillery was that every time you fired it, you'd have to put the gun back into position after firing because of the immense recoil that was produced. When this M777 shoots, massive forces are generated. Without a system to counter recoil, the gun would be jumping several meters backwards. And the rate of accurate fire would be severely slowed. 
In the 1890s, French military engineers design a truly revolutionary piece of artillery, one that solves the problem of recoil. This is it. The French 75 mm field gun. This 1920s model performs ceremonial duties at the US Army's artillery school at Fort Sill, Oklahoma. This is the grandfather of all modern artillery. We wanted a much faster frequency of fire, a more efficient cannon which didn't need to be repositioned after each shot. So it was with this in mind that the French artillery developed a new cannon, the 75. It has to be done in secret. Germany, a rival military power in the second half of the 19th century, launched an espionage operation to gather information on the gun's designs. But France's director of artillery is one step ahead of them. He organized a series of firing tests, knowing full well that German spies would be there to see what was going on. The guns on display are missing one vital component, their hydro-pneumatic recoil system. When the gun fires, oil inside a cylinder is forced one way. Nitrogen gas inside another cylinder flows in the opposite direction, pushing a steel rod that brings the gun barrel back to its starting position. Before the French 75 came along, the average rate of fire for artillery was 10 rounds a minute. A gun team with the French 75 upped that rate of fire from 10 to 20 rounds a minute. It is a phenomenal gun. Naturally, the French 75 has a rifled barrel. It's lightweight and mobile, but robust as well, with a steel gun shield to protect the crew. When we look at this gun, and we consider it against the problems that have faced people over the years of making gunnery, everything is solved in this gun. At the outbreak of World War I, the French 75 becomes the main field artillery piece for both France and the United States. Nineteen fourteen, the Western Front in France. The way that artillery is now used will make this war different from all others. Artillery comes into its own in World War One because the pieces are finally big enough to have a real dramatic impact on the battlefield. Both sides tried the artillery barrage as a means of breaking the stalemate of trench warfare. As a tactic, the barrage was established at least a century earlier in the Napoleonic Wars. But now, guns are massed together in great numbers. They fire further, faster, and more destructively than ever before. This massed bombardment begins and ends at a prearranged time and clears the way for the infantry to go over the top. Only the artillery can flatten enemy barbed wire. Only artillery can destroy the trenches. Only artillery can destroy enemy artillery. So everything in World War I is going to fall on the artillery. What began in the Middle Ages with the trebuchet now reaches horrific fruition as artillery is perfected as a proximity weapon. These shells that they're firing could explode into a thousand pieces. These shells that they're firing could be airburst shrapnel shells that pepper the ground with burning pieces of lead. A million shells were fired in the first week of the Battle of the Somme in 1916. That's a million shells fired by the British alone on a 14-mile front. Thousands of Germans were killed in that initial bombardment. Much of the killing that's done in World War I, the people doing the killing don't know who they're killing or even if they've hit anything at all because the killing is being done from such a distance. Battles now take place over kilometers rather than meters. And for the first time in history, artillery is the greatest killer in war. 
By the end of World War I, 70% of the total casualties had been caused by big guns. And just like their medieval predecessors, World War I generals also realize these weapons can be used to create terror. Germany's Paris gun was a monster. It had a barrel that was 40 meters long and needed a crew of 80 men to fire it. In 1918, it shells the city of Paris from a distance of 121 kilometers. To build a weapon which will fire a shell weighing about a ton that far consistently is incredible. To shoot a projectile such a great distance, German scientists have to factor in the rotation of the Earth and the curvature of its surface. That means the highest point of the shell's trajectory will reach the stratosphere. At such a height, air resistance is reduced, which enables the shell to travel further. The Paris gun was roughly twice the size of this massive German World War II railgun. Though initially successful as a terror weapon, it ultimately caused fewer than 900 casualties. In strategic terms, the Paris gun was a flop. In technical terms, it was a brilliant success. However, knowledge gained from the Paris gun's performance is invaluable. It leads to Germany's V2 rocket program in the 1930s. There's no question that the V2 rocket was not only the world's first strategic ballistic missile, it's the world's first space system. The ballistic missile technology pioneered by the V2 is the catalyst for the Cold War and an arms race between the United States and the Soviet Union. Missiles which are in effect self-powered artillery shells, can now travel across entire continents. The science of killing from great distances reaches evolutionary perfection. For artillery, the focus now switches from maximizing range to achieving pinpoint accuracy. Leyte Gulf. The Philippines, October 1944, World War II. Japanese kamikaze aircraft strike the US Navy. US scientists would soon counter this new threat with a clever artillery invention. The radio proximity fuse, the world's very first smart weapon. Now, the way this thing works is it has a small radio transmitter and receiver built into it on one unit. And it sends out a signal, and when that signal is bounced off a solid object, a receiver will pick that up. When it's close enough, the fuse triggers the shell to explode. It makes an enormous impact on the US Navy's fight in the Pacific, helping ship guns to shoot down countless enemy aircraft. The radio proximity fuse foreshadows a change in weapons design after World War II. Technological systems now do many of the tasks once performed by human beings. The M777, for instance, has a computerized fire control system. This enables the gunner to electronically calculate all the parameters needed to hit a target. This transformation in weapons is now being taken a stage further in the latest artillery systems. This is the N-Loss cannon a realization of a centuries-long search for utmost range and optimum accuracy, now married to modern war's need to minimize the possibility of human error. It's a prototype 155-millimeter self-propelled gun, 
that could soon be entering service with the US Army. The NLOS is being readied for a day's test shooting at Yuma Proving Ground. Traditional gun systems had men in the back that had to lift 100-pound projectiles, lift 20 and 30 pounds worth of propellant, had to do it under very arduous conditions, hot, cold, raining, snow, etc. We've now taken those manual tasks and put them into the hands of machinery, which does it repetitively, always doing it right, never having a failure. Automation is the innovation. Ammunition handling, loading, and the firing of the gun is all done by machine. Where the Paris gun had a crew of 80, the end loss needs just two. These soldiers now have the ability to fight the battle and not be fighting a machine. They're looking at what's going on around them. They're looking at what their commander's asking them to do. They're looking at the terrain. Instead of worrying about is the next round loaded? Is the next round on board? I have a machine that does that for them. Artillery has been a part of war for 2,500 years. In that time, its range, accuracy, destructive power, and technological capabilities have reached ever higher levels. Its evolution has helped produce a type of modern war where battles are remote and the killing is faceless. The big gun, it seems, is here to stay.